And uh, one of the other points that is very implicit in much creationist argument is that we all want to believe, in fact, for some people, they must believe that there's a purpose for themselves and their universe, that this isn't all just kind of happening, that there's a master plan um, for us all. An appeal that is never articulated, but I know that it's there, I know very, very, very viscerally that it's there, is the social acceptance lure of creationism. When I've been to creationist conferences, I can't help but notice how absolutely loving they are to one another. You go there and there's an embrace, there's a welcome, gosh, didn't I see you last year? Oh, sit down next to me at lunch. Um, let's get together later. I love you forever. Um, I will accept you no matter what as long as you have adopted this creed. Um, in science, forget it. In science, they say, you know, we're competing for the same grant money, or you got a better <laughs> lab, or, you know, you got tenure and I want to get tenure. Let's face it, this is very, very appealing. And finally, I say under the heading of in favor of creationism, it feels so virtuous. You know, you'll never feel bad if you're a creationist, and you'll always feel as if, well, your lot is on, on sort of the right side. One of the creationists I talked to said, you know, I've always thought about this, and I figure it's better to be on the safe side. And this has to do with raising children and social acceptance and getting to heaven and everything else. Okay, this is another part I'm not going to dwell too much on all of the legislation that creationists have, have attempted to, to use and all of the, the lawsuits that have resulted from every effort. But let's go back to, I was going to run through some of the high points here. The Butler Act in Tennessee, 1924 said no, no evolution is going to be taught in the Tennessee uh, public school system. And then along came John Scopes. He probably didn't even teach evolution. In the, he was a substitute teacher. He probably didn't even know about evolution himself. But it turned into the well-known circus. And in the end, it didn't do anything. It had absolutely no legislative effect. It had absolutely no any kind of effect, except it, it sold a lot of copies of the Baltimore Sun and, you know, people remember it. Um, in fact, those kinds of laws that it remained on the book and more and more laws, similar laws, were put on the books throughout the rest of the 1920s, including in Arkansas, a law that was not overturned for 40 more years. It remained on the books from 1928 to 1968, when finally some evolutionists said, you know, we've been teaching evolution for a long time, get rid of this law. But still, it, uh, it's, it aroused a lot of, um, a lot of emotions. Um, in Louisiana, a similar type of law was, was finally overturned. Then were equal time laws. Um, well, if you're going to teach evolution at all, you have to teach creationism, either equal time or equal emphasis or the same number of books or something like that. Those have all been thrown out. Then came the, uh, the, the next gasp of the creationists, and that was to put cautionary stickers or statements and the famous case in Cobb County, um, um, Georgia. This is the sticker. This textbook contains material on evolution. Uh, evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origin of living things. This material should be approached with an open mind. Get that. Clever way of twisting things. Studied carefully and critically considered. This same sort of logic is still out there. It's very much a part of the, the, the gasp that is maybe not even unsuccessful at this point. And this is part of the deal for, um, for the intelligent designers. Um, make sure you can freely criticize evolution, but also open your mind to the possibility that supernatural beings are out there. And this is the key book that in Dover, Pennsylvania was encouraged. Um, Dover was what is a similar type of cautionary statement, but the teacher was supposed to say at the beginning of the class, spout some sort of spiel similar to this Cobb County one, and the teachers refused. And there was, this all blew up, as we know, and ended with a great victory for evolutionists and a stunning defeat 
for the creationists and the intelligent design people. Um, but, you know, I have the copy of this book. It's very simpy. It's, um, it, you wouldn't even learn anything from it. You wouldn't learn biology from it because it, it counters an argument that the students wouldn't even know yet. So if, if you want to read a copy of this, I'll, lend, I'll give you mine. Don't give anybody any money for this. I bought mine secondhand, so nobody got any royalty checks. But, um, but it's, it's very feeble, intellectually very feeble. And now we have um, the Louisiana Science Education Act that was passed, and so it is on the books in Louisiana now, that is an academic freedom uh, push. It says something like, um, we're not going to cramp the style of anybody who wants to teach um, a more critical view of whatever we're teaching in science. And they, actually, they listed a few things. <coughs> Evolution was one. Global warming was one. And there are a few other ones that they wanted the students to approach critically, which is a buzzword for rejected. And it really is an attempt to protect teachers from prosecution if they themselves, as they say, one out of six biology teachers, are either believers in creation, young earth creationism, or one out of eight biology teachers, I think this is the statistic, actively, occasionally give, give their students the lesson in class that there is an alternative and that would be creationism or intelligent design. So I'd like to say something. We've talked about the evidence, the, the, the arguments they have that, that, that are anti-evolutionary and the arguments they have that are pro-creation, no, creationistic. Um, what has been possibly good about this century, wait, wait, century and a half, 150 years since, since uh, Darwin, what has been possibly good about the intellectual attacks or the political attacks that creationists have mounted against evolutionists? And I like to think that there really is a positive side of this. Evolutionists, as I've heard them and read them, often respond with a little bit too much indignity. And they lash back with a kind of smug arrogance that I think is self-defeating. Not only is it self-defeating, but it refuses to admit that once in a while the creationists have mounted good arguments. Good arguments that should make us sit back and say, wait a second, it's not because they're right but it's because we have not been effective in conveying what it is that's very, very valuable about science, especially naturalistic assumptions in science. Um, one of my favorite films, Flock of Dodos, in case you've ever seen this, this is a very well done film by a perfectly evolutionarily biased person named Randy Olson. But what makes this film very beautiful is that does never, never, never attack. He even holds his mother up very affectionately as a person who's lured into kinds of sort of spiritual thinking. He gets people through this very non-confrontational approach to admit what it is that, they're, that really worries them. And he gets the scientists to express how flummoxed they are by the debates that go on in their classrooms. And uh, if you have a chance to see this, I, I urge you to. It might even leave you unsettled afterwards, because you want it to take a strong stand, and yet it doesn't. Um, but maybe that's why I like it so much. Everybody needs to sit back and confess their own insecurities, including the sciences, scientists. Forcing people into corners does nobody any good. And the creationists, in fact, love being pushed in a corner because, after all, that makes you the scoffer and then the defenders of the faith, which only adds to the fervor of their beliefs anyway.